let's talk about whether you're healed or just coping. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to today's podcast. My name is Brittany Simon. In today's podcast, inspired by a TikTok that I saw, I thought to myself, oh my gosh, how many people are asking themselves, am I healed or am I coping? And I wanted to ask myself that. As you guys know, I'm obsessed with introspection. It's a journey. It'll take a lifetime. But I do think that I'm having a real relationship with myself on a daily basis minute by minute basis, really. And I have to ask myself, how many parts of myself are still unhealed, right? Because I am a product of trauma. I'm a product of existence. I'm a product in the making. And, you know, I'm not a perfect person. There's going to be a lot of flaws. And I know there are things about me that I still want to heal. Most of the examples that come to mind center around my assault. I really want to get a better grasp of understanding around my PTSD. And I understand I'm very fiery about that subject matter because, of course, I want to protect victims and I want to talk about how it impacts people long term. Not everyone's impacted the same, but I'm still dealing with it for a lot of reasons. So I know there's a wound inside of me that needs to be healed, right? And so that's something that I want to discuss with you. But before we jump into it, let's go ahead and watch the TikTok that inspired this thought process. Links down below for her TikTok channel. So you guys get the theme, right? It's this idea of, am I healed or am I just not in the environment that usually triggers me? You guys know I love my family. They're really, really great, but they are far from per- like perfect. Everyone is far from perfect, but they're very conservative. And as you guys know, I have borderline personality disorder, which the therapist is pretty sure occurred because of the rejection I felt as a gay kid growing up in a conservative household, right? Lots of really interesting things there. Lots of things to explore. I have a relationship with my borderline that is ongoing, but I'm in the maintenance process or time of that healing. So I consider myself uh, in maintenance with the borderline. So I'm not like healed from the borderline, but I know my wounds are calloused over. So now my wounds, I understand where they've come from. I understand why they're there. I haven't been triggered. Like I haven't split or done anything like that in over four years. I've been in constant maintenance. I know some people on the internet will think once you have borderline, you're always wounded. Once you have borderline, you never not split. But studies show that people who get therapy with borderline personality disorder do get better. And over time, it basically goes away. So there's a lot of hope for us. There's a lot of hope for for if you know somebody with borderline. So don't give up. Don't listen to the internet. Don't listen to people who have already given up on you. Don't listen to people who have given up on themselves. You can get better. You can heal your wounds. So borderline in particular, I consider in the maintenance phase, which means my wounds are calloused over, but I'm still going to make sure that they don't reopen because I don't think they're fully healed. I think they're calloused over. Like I think they're they're, they're not like a fully healed wound necessarily. I think if the right circumstance occurred, I could get triggered again and in, in sort of like a, forgive the language, but maybe I could relapse. I'm trying to think of what language to use with borderline. And my family, my friends, everyone around me who's close to me sees how much better I've gotten the internet. If you've really been following my content for a long time, you know how different of a person I am. And that came from so that came from gathering so many tools, so many tools that other people have figured out for their lives and I have taken, they have shared it with me or I've read it in a book or I've seen a YouTube video and I've utilized it in my own life. So I've taken a bunch of notes. I have a way I think about this, the difference between coping and healing. And I want to talk to you about it today. But I think first and foremost, you have to do two things. One, know you can get better. If you don't know you can get better, well, you're going to self-sabotage and don't listen to the people around you who tell you you can't get better. You can get better, okay? The second thing is you have to be radically honest with yourself and that's the hard part. That's the part that makes people doubt your healing. That's the part that makes you doubt your healing. People don't radically accept themselves in their flaws. They don't think they can heal wounds if they admit they're there. They don't think they can get better if they admit they have to deal with horrible illnesses or diseases or chronic health issues. They think, oh no, like once I've been some way, I have to be that way forever. No, you don't. So first step, okay? No, you can get better. Second step, radically accept yourself, okay? So I'm going to run through a problem here that we're going to solve together. It's just an example. So, you know, take this tool and, you know, use it in your life in the way that makes sense for you. So, okay, let's say you have a best friend. 
And that best friend broke your trust. The first time you forgive them. No big deal. It happens, right? The third time, second, I'm sorry, the second time you forgive them. But you're a little hesitant this time, right? You're like, uh, okay, noted. I, I forgive you a second time, but I'm a little hesitant. The third time, okay, they hurt you and you start to put up walls, maybe even barriers, maybe moats, depending on what works for you, okay? So the first time, no big deal. We forgive. The second time, we're a little weary. The third time, okay, let's put up some walls. Walls are not boundaries. Walls can be a, an analogy for a boundary or a metaphor. They could be a, an imagery you create in your mind to say, yeah, a boundary is like a wall, but make sure you're not putting up walls that also stop you from being vulnerable with other people, right? So that usually is the problem. Let's say you eventually make the mistake. Let's call it a mistake. But again, we're using forgiving language here as well as accountability language, mistake, failure. These are accountability languages, but we're going to give you know ourselves some patience and love to get over the hurdles we've created for ourselves. So let's say you created the moat. You okay? I used to have like a hundred walls, a moat, an alligator pit. I used to have like a whirlpool. I used to make sure no one could get close to me, okay? And I I used to put up this front of like, that's just how I am. I'm like Dr. House. I'm like a sociopath. I'm like super, super um, logical and I don't need to have feelings or vulnerability when secretly I was like dying inside for some sort of human connection, right? So I get it. Absolutely understand. Okay. This is a wound we've now created. We have now created a wound in our life because life existence, so we're existing and then everything outside of us existence. So someone in our life, a friend, betrayed our trust. So now we've created a wound because it's happened so many times that now we think it's gonna happen every single time. You've built up years of living with this wound. It's like your new best friend. It goes with every like, you know, outfit you create. It almost feels like it's a real part of you. And it is in some ways, but I, in my work, I think it's important to tell yourself or to have a relationship with yourself about what is going to be healed. And so therefore not a part of you eventually. And what is a part of you as a concrete uh, staple of your personality. So often when we have trauma, yes, it's a part of our story, but I don't think it's really us. I don't think my borderline when I'm triggered is me. I think that's me triggered. When I'm drunk, that's not me. That's drunk Brittany. And she is different from me because she doesn't make the same choices that I would make. I consider my happy, healthy, kind self to be the best version and the only truest version of me. If I'm sleep deprived, I'm not the best version of me and therefore I'm not making decisions I would normally make. I'm making decisions I would make under duress, right? When when you talk about or you read about the studies on stress and how it impacts the body and the mental health and everything you're going through, you're basically a different person. So we don't want it to be an excuse. Oh, well, I was just stressed today. I was uh, triggered today. You want to use it as an explanation so you can get better and stop the cycle of pain you might cause when you're stressed, when you're tired, when you're triggered, right? So you have this wound. It's your new best friend. You've created a whole personality around it, right? I'm stoic. I'm logical. I'm, I'm not in my feelings. I'm angry, but I'm not emotional. You create a persona. It's why when we watch like Fresh and and we see Myron, we're like, who hurt you? Because as much as we want to say that these guys are, um, you know, we make fun of them, we mock them, there's some trauma there. A lot of the alpha guys in this sphere will literally talk about how they got their hearts broken by a girl. And that's why they became alpha men because they didn't want to get hurt anymore. But they're not actually healing the wounds. They're actually just maintaining it. So let's not be like that. Let's actually find some healing, some kindness, some, some, just warmth and patience that we want to give ourselves so we can give it to other people, right? So before this wound happened in your life, let's say you were a warm and considerate person. Let's say you were actually quite thoughtful and quite open and optimistic about people. And when you would meet people, you were like, hey, I'm going to trust you to be a good person. And after some time, we made some decisions of maybe trusting not the greatest people, or maybe we were like really deceived into trusting these people. And so we started to become bitter and pessimistic and, oh my gosh, people just suck. People are the worst. I hate people. Now, don't get me wrong. 
there are two sides of the coin of I don't like people. There's the realistic, like I am a very much like I need my seclusion. I need my peace. Thank you. And then there's a part of me that knows I love people. I just want distance. But there was a stage in my life where I was like, I hate people. I hate people so much. But I didn't hate people. I hated the wounds that people caused. I hated the pain that people caused. And I still kind of do. I just know now that I just don't like bad behavior. It's not that I don't like people. It's not people. It's what people do when they're peopling. Humans are going to human, right? At the base of us, I think there's this personality, this real version of us that's happy, healthy, and kind, right? And I think that's the version of us we want to bring back to the surface. It's not that we want to go back and be that person because that can't happen, but we want to elevate that part of us so sh we are that person most of the time. We are happy, kind, and healthy. And that version of us is very specific. For some of us, the journey is very short to find that version of us, to resurrect her from the dead or him or them. But for some people, it's a longer stretch of time, right? I would argue that I have been in search of a good version of myself before trauma from like nine till 30. That's that was my journey. OK, and at 30, I kind of woke up one day after doing lots of lots of work and I had this epiphany, this moment where I was like, oh. OK, things just kind of clicked for me. Now, I'm still, like I said, healing from certain wounds. I'm still on a specific journey, but the journey is mine. I'm no longer bitter at the world I'm more like okay humans are gonna human this is my radical acceptance mantra that I tell myself humans are gonna human I radically accept that human beings are gonna do exactly what they think is right and then I as a consci consciousness is gonna decide how to have boundaries with those people I don't want to destroy the world I don't want to hurt people I don't want to encourage people to hurt each other and in order to do that I have to first get it out of my mind that I know what's good for 8 billion people I have to first remind myself that I am a person with an ego like everyone else on the planet. And assuming I know what's best for everyone else is the same mistake everyone else made before me. Oh, I know better than you. I get to dictate your life. I know what's sin. I know what's healthy. I know what's, you know, and I know that there is a capital T version of humanity that's sort of healthy and kind. Whether or not we'll have a relationship with it, who knows? But for me, I know I can have it with my consciousness. I can't have it exactly with humanity. I don't know how to make humanity healthy and kind in, in all these things that I want for it. But I know how to do it for myself because I'm learning and I'm picking up tools and I'm getting better at it, right? And again, we're not perfect, right? We've all seen me. I've openly admitted I've been PTSD triggered on the internet. I haven't had borderline issues in four years. People always assume it's borderline because they think PTSD is not that bad. But it can be, and it can look similar, but it's not the same. Distortion happens and with all kinds of people, even people without borderline or PTSD. Distortion is a part of uh, how we're relating to the circumstance, right? So again, I try to own up to all the moments I've had, all the lapses, so I can make sure to get better. You're giving yourself the real information, radically accepting exactly what happened so you can get better. Okay, because again, our aim is to get back to that version of ourselves as happy, help, healthy, happy, and kind, right? Okay, so we build up this persona, we lose our warmth, we come off like we're super logical and we have no feelings and we're just like very, you know, but what we've, do, what we've done is we've allowed the wound to be the forefront of our personality. So how do we even come back from that when we've built up this persona? Well, first you have to be willing to change, which is really hard. And you have to be willing to say like, oh man, I really was kind of like, look at me all edgy and stuff. You have to be willing to admit like I was cringe. And I know every year as a YouTuber, I look back at my content and I'm like, oh, cringe. And that's like the best worst part about being a YouTuber is you get to look back on it and see it in real time. And also it's on the internet. So people also see your cringe, right? I think one of the key, key, key components that comes into not wanting to heal is also you don't want to be disappointed again. You have this hope that humanity will be kind to you. You have this hope that you will be kind to yourself. And then you disappoint yourself. You dis you're disappointed by the world existence. You're disappointed. You're disappointed. You're disappointed. But I really think vulnerability and hope and faith in yourself, in humanity, is really key to healing because it is scary. I can't guarantee your happiness. I can't guarantee your joy. I can't guarantee a good outcome. I can't guarantee peace. I can't guarantee anything. None of us can. We can only do the work in hopes that it pays off. Everything in life is a gamble. And sometimes it is easier just to wallow in our self-misery because at least it's something that we know. Sometimes you guys will hear me say, I miss depressed Brittany. 
but man, I don't, I don't really want to go back there. I worked so hard to tackle my depression, to tackle my borderline. I worked so hard because if I didn't, honestly, like it would have unalived me. And I, I don't have time to unalive myself. I'm busy living a life. But again, I had to get to the point where I radically accepted and changed my perception of my life to actually want to stay alive. If you're like me and you struggled with unaliving all of your life, it was always to escape pain. It was never to escape living. But living can be pain. With, as somebody with fibromyalgia, living itself can be pain. But again, since life is default suffering, right? How do I turn this suffering into a relationship I can have with it so it doesn't disrupt my joy? And it's all about really understanding yourself. Again, we start with ourselves, we go to others, and we end with ourselves. Be open to being vulnerable, be open to the world, but have boundaries. So going back to that TikTok, we have to ask ourselves, are we healed or are we just not around people that trigger us? I think what goes into this the most is understanding the differences and in the, in the why, right? So again, I love my family. They're wonderful. But being around them can often make me very upset. I don't distort and I don't get triggered, uh, like borderline triggered, but I get, um, I get like overstimulated and I become very emotional because it's very hard to listen to a lot of people sit there who don't share the same reality as you, just be like, gay people aren't real, like trans people who? What are you talking about? Trans people are drag and drag is trans and they don't even know, like they have no information at their fingertips to even understand like the LGBT community and you can't explain it to them because they've already decided like not a thing, right? So instead of explaining it to them and trying to do that, I radically accept that they will be religious and not change, but they're still good people because they're trying, most people are, but they don't have the openness to actually allow themselves a reality where like LGBT is a thing. So I try to like avoid these conversations. It doesn't always happen. My parents are very opinionated. My family's opinionated. But what I try to process is that I'm allowed to be upset because it's very upsetting to hear people that you love and who love you to continually make it a thing that you don't exist. You were only queer because you must have been hurt as a child. The irony. And it is difficult. So I'm not saying it's not. And for a lot of you, you might not be ready to radically accept your family for who they are. This for me was a process. Decades long process of radically accepting my family for who they are. They're lovely people like most of the world. But like most of the world, they kind of drive me a little crazy because they're not agreeing that I should exist. They're not agreeing on my civil rights. They're not agreeing on validating who I am because if I just got better via their way of getting better, I wouldn't be who I am. The irony, right? So again, depending on where you are. So I would argue that I'm pretty healed when it comes to visiting my family because I don't get like distorted, triggered. I don't lose myself like I used to. I don't want to die when I'm with them. Like I don't really want to unalive myself. I don't actually go back to that space. I just openly admit, hey, I'm, you're overstimulating me and I need space to process this because I don't want to have these conversations. I'm open, but I have boundaries. I'm open but I have boundaries. Going back to a classic mantra on this channel, I'm open. I love you. I'm open, but not at the expense of my mental health, not at the expense of my peace, not at the expense of my joy, but I love you. I see you. I see the world and its chaos and how we're constantly destroying ourselves and how it's easy to go back into bitterness, how it's easy to go back to hating people, but I choose joy. And joy means radically accepting that humans are going to human. And I am just in a moment of history. I am a blip in the timeline. And no one's going to remember me. All that matters is what we do now in this moment. And in this moment, I choose love. In this moment, I choose understanding. And then I vent to my partner about, oh my gosh, how annoyed I am. Blah, blah, blah. And then I, you know what I mean? Okay, so like, don't worry. You still get to vent while you choose peace. Okay, I choose peace. But I'm going to vent about it, okay? So you've got a bestie. We're going back to the bestie. You've got a bestie and they've betrayed you and now you've got this wound. Well, first and foremost, you have to ask yourself these questions. Okay, this is what I did. I'm not saying it will work for you, but I'm saying it works, okay? Tell me. Tell me if it works for you in the comment sections down below. Okay, start with this. You want friends or closer friends, but are afraid of, of getting hurt, right? So you pretend to not need them. But why do you want friends? You need to answer this. This is a very hard question to answer. It seems easy. I just want someone to hang out with. Well, girl, you could. You don't need friends for that. 
You know that, right? You don't need friends to hang out with people. So why do you really want friends? And then what does a friend mean to you? Write this down. Write it down, okay? You need to answer these questions. Then you spend that time convincing other people so you can convince yourself you don't need friends, right? I don't need friends. What are friends? When you secretly want connection. But what is the connection you need, right? What happens when you're ready to face this, okay? How do you go from wounded to healed? Okay, you take the wound apart. This is, for me, this is how I think about it. I imagine a cobweb that's all stuck together. And if you've seen this, cobwebs are crazy, right? But this cobweb had individual strands at one point. So I imagine myself in my mind slowly taking them apart until I can start to form the original web. Now, okay, this is hard. That's why it's, that's why I use the spider web um, analogy, but it's hard, okay? But it's a thing you can do, right? So you start to get to the core of the wound, to heal the wound, to get back to your core personality. Okay, so ready? I'm gonna put a little graph on the screen. So if you guys are listening on Spotify or you're listening in your audio and you're not looking, I'll put a little graph on the screen, okay, just to help you out a little bit because it really helped me figure out this visual. So how to care for the wound, okay? Every wound will be different. So remember, take this tool and utilize it towards your kind of wound. First, you have to identify the kind of wound. In this example, we're talking about friendship right? You have a bestie and they've betrayed you, right? They betrayed the trust of the friendship, okay? So in this example, we're talking about betrayal, okay? And we're talking about abandonment, okay? Those are the two things we're talking about. These are two separate things. So you have to, again, take apart the web. So you're taking apart those two concepts, betrayal and abandonment. So betrayal goes from betrayal to trust broken. That's one of the breakdowns. You go back to abandonment and you break it down and it goes to denying access, right? So I've betrayed and I'm feeling abandonment. I had my trust broken. And usually when there's a break of trust in the relationship, it usually comes at the expense of the relationship dissolving, therefore abandonment, denying access. So now because we've broken up our friendship, we're not friends anymore, right? Because trust has been broken or I can maintain a friendship with you where my trust consistently gets broken. But then where do my boundaries come into play, right? Where does my peace come into play there? So then you break it down more. Betrayal, trust broken. Uh, what is trust? So now you have to identify what is trust. For me, trust is the expectation of the negotiated expectation. <laughs> so Trust is the expectation of the negotiated expectation. Okay, we negotiate. You will not uh, tell people my secrets. And then if you tell people my secrets, now I can't trust you to hold the expectation of not telling people my secrets, right? So we've made a contract and you break the contract, right? So we go back to abandonment. Abandonment is denying access. What is access? Now, access is a hard one because I'm open, but with boundaries. So how do we pair when people should have access to us? So for me and my family, love them to bits and pieces, love them so much, would fight the world for them, right? We have a very much like I'm open, but with boundaries, okay? I went to therapy and took those tools and gave it to my family to the best of my ability for those of them that would take it. And I said, hey, look, I love you, but like I can't be around you right now. I love you, but like this conversation is making me feel uneasy. I love you. It starts off with love always love. I love you or I love me, but love has to be the center. I love enough to want peace. I love enough to have boundaries, not to put ultimatums on you, which I don't technically have a problem with depending on the context, but to say <clears throat> in order for us to continue having a healthy interaction, let's take a break. I'm not abandoning you. I'm not leaving you, but I am denying access to you on a spectrum. I'm denying access to you right now, but I will reopen access when we're in a better state, right? This is to be negotiated, to be explained, depending on your investment in the friendship, right? In the interaction. So with my family, of course, I want to, I want them to know I love you, but I need some space. Okay. I need some space because if I give you access to me right now, unfiltered, unchallenged with no boundaries, I will loop because right now you're not seeing me. I think there's this misconception that when people love us, they can see us fully. I think there's this misconception that if I find the right group of friends, they're going to see every part of me and they're always going to treat me perfectly. But I don't think that's how it works. I think people come in and out of your life and some stay for a long time and some stay for a little time and they see parts of you and you connect and you get along. But I don't think people see every part of us 
enough to never hurt us. I don't think even seeing every part of you means you don't hurt each other. It could just mean you don't hurt each other on a certain level. Like I think my partner who I married is bound to just hurt me less over time in very small ways because we see each other so much. But that doesn't mean we won't accidentally say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing or accidentally be a human and hurt each other. We just probably won't hurt each other to the same extent that my parents, un, you know, unawarely, even though they are aware, tend to do because they refuse to see the queerness in their children, right? If you can't see a part of somebody you're going to think you're always doing good for them. You know, r the road to hell is paved in good intentions. And I think so many people want to love us with their good intentions, but that's not okay. So you have to be the one to say, I love you too, but boundaries. I'm open, but with boundaries. I love you. Boundaries. Okay, so let's go back. So betrayal, trust is broken. What is trust? It's an agreement, not an assumption. So many people, like I said before, Make the assumption in relationships, this person loves me, they'll see me. This person loves me, I can trust them. Trust is a negotiated. There is, there, the mistake is the assuming part, right? I assume my partner will do X because that's what I would do as a partner. Well, is your partner you? Are you marrying your consciousness? No. You're marrying a whole new consciousness all on their own, a person who has a relationship with the world, and you need to make sure they understand you. Abandonment, denying access, what is access, time and intimacy. So going back to when you're forming those boundaries, you're saying this is my time and here's my intimacy and I might need to take a break from both of those things because we're sharing in a symbiotic way. But when it starts or stops becoming symbiotic and it feels like I'm putting in a lot and you're putting in nothing because we're not meeting each other, we're not seeing each other, maybe it's time to take a break. We're negotiating for time and intimacy with the people we love and with the people we want to build trust with. So if you have a bestie and you guys are friends and then trust is broken, well, time and intimacy need to be renegotiated, right? You're talking about your literal time and intimacy, your psyche, your sense of peace. You should constantly be updating that relationship with yourself and others. So I made another little graph here. OK, I'm going to do it with my hands, but I'm also going to put it on screen here. So you have yourself, right? Always yourself. OK, you have um, yourself themselves. OK, your friend, you. Then you have the middle part, which is together. So you have like these two little balls. That's how I imagine it. And we're our little floating cautious, we're like these little souls. Doo -doo -doo -doo. And then these souls come together and it's like, oh, a new form of a shape. And then they separate again and then they come together and then they separate again. And when you are together, you're different because you're a different shape. And when you're separate, you're different because you're a different shape, right? So you want to make sure that when you are separate, you pay attention to the details of that shape your mood, who you are, where you're at, where's your sense of peace. And then when you're together, you have to ask yourself the same questions. Hey, I noticed that when I'm with you, I don't always feel good about myself. I noticed that when I'm with you, you kind of like take little jabs at me. And I noticed the shape I start to form when I'm with you makes me feel icky. And then the person can go, oh my gosh, like what am I doing wrong? I'm so sorry. Or they can say, um, sounds like a you problem, which don't get me wrong. Many times in my past, my sister and I would have that classic TikTok argument of like older sister bullying younger sister and younger sister saying like, why are you being so mean? And older sister saying, sounds like you're sensitive. My sister and I have had that argument many times in our, in our youth. Absolutely. And there is a reason that stereotype exists, but it's our job as we age to make a more concerted effort to have a more peaceful relationship. And again, it has to be because we want it. It can't be because one of us wants it. It has to be both of us because both of us are forming the shape together. And then we have to radically accept what shape it can even take. I think there's this assumption, once again, I've heard from people saying, well, if you love me, you'll want to see every part of me. I don't think that's true. I think that's only true for partners you have lifelong relationships with. I don't think that's true for friends. I think because I consider parts of myself so important, like I consider my sexual part so important, who I'm physically intimate with so important. How can I ask my friends and family to see that part of me, y'all? So when you say like, oh, I think we should be able to see every part of each other, ma'am, uh, this is not the South, ma'am. What are we talking about, ma'am? Like, no, thank you, ma'am. So again, I think there's a misunderstanding uh, here about what seeing every part of you could look like. So instead, I would prefer that people see what they can and we build a relationship we can with that. 
So when we're building trust, we're building time and intimacy with somebody else. It's why I'm always shocked when there's like this misunderstanding between friendships. Like, oh, how did we get here? Well, we probably just didn't talk clearly about it. We probably didn't have the right conversation. We probably didn't build the right stepping stones. And that's why I think everyone always talks about foundation, building a good foundation, right? Like I've had the same lifelong friends for a really long time at this point. And though I've had a lot of friends come and go, I've had a few betrayals myself. Let me tell you, they could write an anime about it. I know now looking back in hindsight exactly why the things happened the way they did. It's canon, girl. It's a part of the road. It's a part of your story. It's a part of your anime that you will make mistakes along the way in your life. Whether you're 30, 40, 15, 12, 9, 100, there will be moments in your life where you're like, oop, miscalculation. You have to be forgiving to yourself, open with yourself. You have to radically accept your mistakes. And then you have to heal the wounds. So when I looked at my life and I thought about, man, all these abandonment issues I have is about like time, intimacy, trust, boundaries, agreements. It's about really knowing what I needed. So when you ask yourself, like, am I healed or am I just away from all the things that bring up my wounds? And it's really about testing it out and seeing. Like when I was home back um, in the summer before I moved to Europe, I went home, stayed with my parents for about a month. And man, every time I leave at home, I remind myself of why I cannot live at home. So you guys know I would rather get four jobs and live on my own than live at home. Even though my family will feed you, love you, watch shows with you at night, laugh. Like it's so fun being home as a visitor. I love visiting my family. But when you live there for a long time, you remember like, oh, yeah, my parents are really religious. So there's going to be like lots of Catholic references. And oh, my gosh, I can't say and oh, my gosh, I can't do X, Y and Z. I can't dress how I want. They're very conservative. No midriff in this town. And so there's this realization that the person that you are has to start with you for this reason. You cannot make your whole identity about other people because at the end of the day, you go home to yourself and the one or two people that you might end up living with or co like cohabitating with maybe your cat, but you're, you're really talking about yourself, what you need without judging other people. Look, I could just turn around, be better and say, well, if my parents would just change, don't you think they feel the same way about me? If my daughter would just change, we could get along all the time. Or we could radically accept that we're different and find the places we get along in and have that relationship. Because I don't want my mom to have to change and I still want to call her every day and be like hey girl my mom and I our relationship is so much better when I don't live at home I love calling my mom but my mom isn't my friend she's like my mom right and she is somebody that I call to get advice from or to talk to because even though we're very different she does still have good advice about life she's lived over 60 years there's some pockets of wisdom in there girls but I just don't call her up to ask her hey mom how do I get my OF page to do better Maybe we don't call my mom up and ask her that, girls. Maybe I don't call my mom up and like, hey, mom, so just question. When I'm dating a woman, how do you think we should? Come on, read the room. Read the room. You are also responsible for the expectation and assumption you put on the people in your life. I think because we're raised with this assumption that our parents will be there for us always, we do like we twist what that could mean I used to just I just wanted my parents to love me for everything that I was I just wanted parents that would be pro-gay if I could just have that maybe the world would be better but then I look at my gay friends who have pro-gay parents and they're still in therapy because it was never about being just pro-gay sometimes people can't always meet you where you're at and it doesn't have to be the end of the world you can have boundaries You can have healthy relationships. You can have dysfunction in the relationship because sometimes not everybody gets the right kind of help they need and still maintain your joy by having the boundaries. Somebody in your life might still have to deal with the dysfunction of their own life. Maybe you have some of it as well. I feel like everyone has dysfunction on a spectrum, right? You can still be happy and healthy and kind if you're self-aware enough to care for it to heal the wounds and a process that some of them might take years and years and years and maybe even a lifetime to heal. You can get better. But it doesn't mean everyone around you is also going to get better. So start with yourself. What do you want and need? These are different things. Need is a necessity. Want is a, that would be nice. 
asks the existence, hey, do you want this? What do you want? See how it works with what you want and need. See what you can work out. And then make sure you still choose your joy at the end of the day. There's so much pressure from people around us to cater to the needs, to sacrifice your own on behalf of theirs. There's so much push from the world to say, suffer for me. And sometimes, you know, because we all have to suffer in some ways, maybe we need to. But I think you can get out of that cycle of unnecessary suffering. There's a lot of unnecessary suffering and hurt people hurt people. And it starts with you. You are not exempt from being the hurt person who hurts other people. So you can heal your wounds, but you have to break down the wound itself. Why is it there? Mostly expectation is not aligning with reality, right? And we're not negotiating well our boundaries for our intimacy and our time. You are separate, right? When you're separate from someone, you are a completely different shape. And the moment you combine yourself with somebody, friendship, lovership, parents, the shape changes because you're now in a co like you're co collaborating, right? You're collaborating. So when you're collaborating, be aware of that. I think sometimes what happens is that people will be in a collaborating situation, but they'll be like really selfish and like, I'm going to do what I want to do. Fine, but you should do what you want to do when you're solo. And when you're collaborating, you should try to compromise because you're collaborating. But when you're not collaborating, you know what I mean? Then you really, you don't have to. You can just do whatever. So you have to know the circumstance in which you're even evaluating. Like you have to evaluate the situation realistically, right? Anyways, I really like that TikTok. I thought it was funny. It's a good question to ask yourself. Are you coping, hiding away from all the things that make you upset so you can pretend you're good? All those people who are like, I just want to live in a forest and I don't want to pay my bills and I just want to, I was there too. I get it. I understand. It sounds really nice, right? I'm just going to live in a forest. Tell me that's not a cope. Tell, tell me that half, is, a half of cottagecore audiences are just coping. They want to run away from their responsibilities. They want to run away from the world. But if you're like me, an American woman born in America, there is toughness there. But girl, I make my own money. And that is something that my ancestors can't exactly say for themselves. So I'm doing pretty good. If I'm a blip in history, this is a pretty good time to be a blip. This is a pretty good time to be a blip. Okay? So you can run away. But like, has that ever worked for anyone? Has running away from your problems ever worked for anyone? All right. I will talk to you soon. I hope this podcast helped. Please let me know. Comment sections down below. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I will see you guys next week. And oh, I'm very excited. I'm moving into my new place. So you guys will see it very soon. I'm stoked, I'm stoked, I'm stoked. I worked so hard to overcome mental health, to work and maintain it, to make money, to be independent so I can have this apartment. I promise you. I worked so hard to have the life I wanted. And you absolutely can do it too. Don't believe anyone who says you can't get better. Okay, talk to you soon. Bye. In my head, in my head, my belly's being fed, and I'm okay. I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine. Not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense. I've been nothing but blessed, so why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking. Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool